Welcome, and thank you for joining. Today's topic is critical factors to consider when performing a Google Cloud migration. My name is Andy Wiesner, and I'm a solution architect here at ManageCore. I'm also a certified OSDB migration consultant, and I have 12 years of SAP basis consulting experience. During that time, I've been able to help over 50 customers with their SAP landscapes, performing anything from day-to-day -day administration, upgrades, conversions, and migrations. I've experienced working both on-premise as well as in the cloud, and most recently, I've been able to help several customers make their move to Google Cloud Platform. As we begin today, I'd like to talk briefly about ManageCore. ManageCore is an SAP and cloud managed services provider. We're a premier Google Cloud partner with a specialization in running SAP in Google Cloud. We also have partnerships with SAP, and we're excited to partner with C2C for this presentation today. ManageCore has a complete portfolio of solutions to help our customers upgrade and transform their systems, migrate to the cloud, and maintain day-to-day -day operations of their systems. All of our services leverage our watchdog monitoring and automation platform. So today I hope that our session will be informative. Certainly everyone is welcome to ask questions regarding today's topic, and I'll provide information on how to reach us here at ManageCore. So again, today we're discussing some important factors to consider for your migration to Google Cloud. To get started, let me start by saying that Google Cloud is a great choice. Migrating to Google Cloud comes with many benefits, but there's also many challenges with any cloud migration project. When we boil it down, after successful migration, your data is available in the cloud, your systems are available, and your systems are working well. In most migration scenarios, before and after the migration, hopefully your users will not notice a difference, at least not right away. The inverse, in the worst case scenario, migrations could result in errors, poor system performance, um, or in a worst case, maybe there's missing data, there's data corruption, systems are unavailable, um, you've got unplanned downtime, you have users that are dissatisfied, and you've increased or exceeded the cost for your migration project. Hopefully we can avoid all of those worst case scenarios. And to do that, I'd like to propose to you today three key points, planning, experience, and communication. So let's take each of these in turn. When we talk about planning for a cloud migration project, planning comes in a lot of different forms. Generically, first thing that we want to do in any planning scenario is to ask questions. You could generically ask who, what, where, when, how. Um, questions that are who's going to do the work, what teams need to be involved. We want to start assessing the scope of our project. Maybe that might be the systems that need to move into the cloud. Are there any dependencies between the various servers and the applications that you're looking to move? Are you going to have applications and servers in Google Cloud that are also connecting back to applications and servers that are on premises? You may want to look into Will you be replicating your corporate DNS or Active Directory into Google Cloud? Maybe what regions and zones do you want to deploy in? Um, even getting down into some of the architecture components. As we assess the scope, we also want to start putting together a timeline. And the timeline is going to be dictated um, as much by the level of effort and how long it takes to actually complete the project but then maybe there's also some business drivers. So the timeline should account for all of those things. And you wanna look at all of the different iterations that are gonna happen. In most cases for migrations, you're going to do the move in multiple phases. Um, you'll move your sandbox systems first, followed by development, quality. There might be a mock production run. And finally, your production cutover. So as you start developing your scope, your timeline, that should start to feed into a project plan. And ultimately, as you're going through and performing these iterations, you want to be developing a runbook or a cutover plan. And that cutover plan is what you would ultimately follow uh, in your production go live. You've got a little bit more leeway typically 
in a development or a QA environment where you could have some additional downtime. But obviously, once we're in production, there's typically only so long that you have to accomplish your downtime and the scope of the work. So all of that needs to be put into your project plan and into a cutover plan. Another facet of planning is in architecture. And when we look at architecture, um, again, there's a lot of components. You know, when we look at Google Cloud, you can think of it that you've been given a box of Legos and you've got all sorts of different blocks of colors and shapes and sizes. And without instructions, without a roadmap, without that architecture, you have just a pile of bricks. But the architecture is really where you start taking all of those building blocks and putting them together and forming them into what will become your solution. So let's talk about that a little bit more specifically. Um, one of the things that we always consider first is uh, what we call cloud foundation. And that's ultimately going to be the configuration of your organization and of your projects themselves. Um, what is going to be the hierarchy for your organization? Do you have different departments, different projects? Once we've kind of assessed some of that, then we start looking into networking and connectivity. How are the VPCs and the subnets laid out? How is connectivity being established both within your regions in Google Cloud, but also connecting back to your on-premises sites and any of your data centers, even looking into uh, firewalls and security. Cloud security is another big one. Um, and, and this is one where you may ask more questions. Um, your organization may have different security and compliance requirements that have to be accounted for as we're building out this architecture for Google Cloud. Another facet is going to be disaster recovery. Um, you want to be sure that any time that you're putting things into the cloud, that you're also architecting for the resiliency and the uptime SLAs that you need for your specific applications. In some cases, you've got an application where some downtime is accessible. In other cases, every second of downtime is costing the organization money. And that's going to dictate what types of solutions do you need to put in place, whether it's high availability or disaster recovery. And if you're doing availability across zones, across regions. Um, finally, a last facet that goes into your architecture is going to be the billing accounts. Um, and again, this kind of feeds into how is your organization structured and where are the various cost centers located? Does each department have its own billing account um, and its own budget for their projects in Google? Or is everything rolling up under the master IT budget? Um, these are all things that you want to consider um, how those billing accounts and everything else rolls together. So again, Planning is really one of the first things that you need to do when you begin the project and certainly something that you'll revisit and tweak as the project continues on, but definitely a very important point. So a second key consideration when we look at cloud migration is experience. Um, moving to the cloud is something that is very complex. Um, you know, the cloud has made the technologies very accessible, but it's really important that you have the right experience when you're embarking in on a migration project like this. With experience, um, there's probably a number of different roles that are going to be participating in this kind of a project. You could have a cloud architect uh, or a cloud engineer. Maybe you've got an SAP basis person, project managers. Um, each of those roles is going to be performing different pieces of work for the project. On a very small project, you might have the same person that's doing all of these different roles. In larger projects, you may have multiple architects, multiple engineers, multiple project managers even. And so depending on the scale of the project may dictate how many people you need to be working on this project. When we're also looking at the people that are doing the project, you want to consider what is their experience? Have they done a migration to Google Cloud? Maybe are there any certification requirements? With 
all of these different requirements and all of the complexity of migration, something that we see very commonly is choosing a partner. Um, and choosing a partner for a project can really help to mitigate the project risk, help the project to stay on time or on budget, and ultimately lead to the project's success. So certainly, if the migration to the cloud is something that's very daunting, um, engaging a partner can be a great way to get that experience that you need to ensure that you have a successful project. If you decide to look for a partner, Google has a great partner ecosystem. And one of the things that you want to do is look for companies who are first and foremost Google Cloud partners. But certainly if you're doing a migration for SAP, it's also good to look for someone that is or has a specialization on SAP or a specialization for whatever the technology is that you're moving into Google Cloud. And then certainly the individual consultants, you want to look for someone that is certified in Google Cloud. You can look for the Google Professional Cloud Architect. From an SAP standpoint, having an SAP migration consultant is an invaluable resource to this type of a project. So again, the experience. So the final point that I want to talk about today is communication. Communication is really a key thing in any project. Um, a lot of times breakdowns in projects can be attributed to breakdowns in communication. Um, when we talk about communication, there's a lot of different forms that are going to take place. Um, you know, certainly one of the key things that you want to do in a migration project is keep the business informed. You want your users to be aware of when the systems are going to be down, knowing that things are moving, and this can help to anticipate uh, any requests after applications move. Keeping the stakeholders up to date is another big key point. Um, you want to make sure that they know about the project, um, know about what the timeline is going to be, and keeping them up to date with what is the pro progress of the, the project. Um, is everything moving ahead according to schedule? Are you still on budget? Or are there some deviations and do we need to course correct a little bit? Certainly communication between the teams is also really important. Um, and this becomes even more important the larger your organization is. Um, I've seen a lot of companies where the IT and the business teams are very siloed. And maybe you've got a designated network team, an infrastructure team, a security team, an audit team, an application team. And all of these different teams, if they're not talking to each other, you can miss key pieces in the project. Um, the application team, when they're moving an application into the cloud, may not ask the network team to open up specific ports in the firewall. And after the migration, then there's a breakdown, or maybe there's an application that's not working because there was that lapse in communication. So it's important that all the teams stay in sync and stay on the same page as they're embarking on these kind of migration projects. Something that I've seen very beneficial, and this helps, especially if there are very large teams, um, would be to have liaisons for each group that's involved in the project. And that way you can minimize the number of people that are in these project meetings, but then those liaisons can go back, report to the different groups on what's going on and kind of get that dialogue and that communication going. Um, certainly for the larger projects, you want to designate a communication manager. Um, sometimes that's the project manager. Sometimes that's an, a whole separate role, um, depending on what your communication requirements are. Um, you know, certainly once you look at all of the different people that need to be informed on a migration project, um, that communications can become a full-time job, um, especially when it is informing the business, all the stakeholders, all the different teams. Um, so it's very beneficial to have someone that is assigned and designated as the communication manager for the project. Certainly, if you're engaging with a partner, partners can help immensely, uh, both in terms of providing people that can be project managers, communication managers, but the partners will also have a good framework for a communication plan. Um, they can help you 
figure out when are the times that you need to communicate with who and ultimately who needs to be notified with these different things. So communication um, is, is definitely something that is very important. And I think that sometimes it's overlooked because it's such a simple thing. So these are just three of the examples that I have uh, for critical items to consider for a migration. Of course, that there are tons and tons more. And I'd love to hear um, everyone else's insights into that. Um, so certainly, if you have any comments on today's presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please do contact us. You can reach out to us uh, at ManageCore, uh, certainly www.managecore.com. And you can also uh, reach myself um, or anyone from the ManageCore team, and we'll be glad to assist you. So again, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.